All right, well, I uh, wanted to redo this particular recording because I felt that it was necessary that somebody who was in need of this particular message would get it. Our internet went down at the church service, and so I'm redoing this for you, whoever you are that needs this in your time of fear, anxiety, worry. This message will help you to learn how to pilot your fears while you go through storms. So in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15, it says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Lord, I do pray that you would be with whoever needs this message and why you compelled me to redo it for the sake of somebody hearing it. Lord, there's not a whole lot of people who watch, but Lord, I know that there may be someone who may need what, what is preached. And so I pray that you would just anoint me once again as I preach this a second time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John Hiltabidel was an excellent naval jet fighter pilot. His training was top of the line, and he was known as one of the best in his class. His son went to school with me, and we were in Cub Scouts together and Boy Scouts together, and we even lived on the same street together. So naturally, I got to hear a lot of uh, John Hiltabidel's famous naval battle stories uh, during Vietnam and other time periods, and uh, he was quite the storyteller. And one particular story that I will remember I'll, I, I will never forget the story that he told. It was a night flight. I don't know uh, if he was exaggerating or not, but the way that he told it, I imagine that he wasn't. But it was a night flight, and an unnerving bolts of lightning seemed to flash like the grand finale of a fireworks display as he flew on in darkness, rain, and lots of turbulence. The storm apparently shifted, forcing John to fly through it. His superiors would have never scheduled a night flight, a night run for John in these weather conditions. First of all, they valued John as a pilot, and uh, they valued his experience, and they valued his life, but also, furthermore, the idea of sending an F-4 Phantom II into the middle of a storm like the one John was in would be enough for the captain to lose his commission. So, upon his safe return, heads would be questioned. And if the outcome were any less fortunate, heads would definitely roll. And might even do the same anyway, depending on his evaluation. He'd been through storms before, but on this night, because of the obscured vision, and because tension was high, he kept his eyes fixed on his instruments. Especially his attitude. It was a habit he had always been in, even in good weather. He didn't feel like things were wrong. Though the storm was rough as he approached the aircraft carrier, everything was good to go, as always. So he thought. He radioed in as he approached the carrier. Tower Sam 89, 5 mile, carrier 5, gear down. The carrier responded, Sam 89, winds 3, 340 at 13, gust 20 runway, carrier 5, cleared to land. Cleared to land? Carrier 5, Sam 89, John copied as he checked his attitude indicator. Wait a second. Upside down. That's what he was reading all right. But was it right? Was there something wrong with the instrument? He'd never had something happen like this before. The instrument read that he was perfectly in line with the horizon yet he was upside down. Something wasn't right. Either it was John or it was the instruments. Of course, John, trained only by the best, was told to always trust his instruments. That mamby-pamby garbage about trusting your gut feeling will get you killed, his superiors would tell him. As strange as it appeared, John, in the moment of decision, trusted the instruments. He flipped his plane. Though everything in him said he was flipping his fighter upside down, the instruments read that he was right side up. Obviously, his decision is why you are hearing this story right now. 
He landed safely on the carrier and lived to tell about it. Last Sunday, if you recall, in our series of I'm Just Weird, I emphasized that we all go through storms. It's in these storms that we learn just a little more how to trust the instruments that God has given to us. These instruments are found in the Word of God. They are worthy to be trusted. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Because Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Your heart will, your heart will tell you you're okay. It will convince you that checking the instruments only if you sense trouble is enough to get you through. But if you ask any pilot, not checking your instruments is, and I quote a pilot, stupid. Sin is stupid. Pride is sin. And therefore, having a sense that somehow your instruments will save you only when you're going to crash is also stupid. Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. And what is a good man in the habit of doing? Listen to Psalm 119, 133. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Psalm 119, 11 says, Thy word is thy word if I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Joshua 1, 8 says, uh, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. That means you'll have a good flight. You'll reach your destination. The great thing about this, the Holy Spirit as our air traffic controller is that he's with you when you're not sure what to do. You don't have to worry about him being in a tower and radioing in. You have to do the flying, but he's with you every step of the way. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, God is my co-pilot. I've heard some people say God is my co-pilot, and then I've heard others say that God is my pilot. I, I, I just fly with him. I let him do all the flying. Well, neither one of those are right. He is, in fact, the chief pilot. He's the senior pilot in charge, but he tells you what to do, and you're the one that does the flying. That's what it means when the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Turn to Hebrews 4.12 if you have a Bible. Here is perhaps the closest definition to an, to an attitude indicator that I can find in the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, The Word of God, for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In a pilot's paraphrased version, the Word of God is an attitude indicator that will tell you what's really going on. In line, nose diving, ascending, or even upside down. You see, friends, depression, anxiety, fear, stress, they are all heart problems. They are, in fact, byproducts of your attitude not being readjusted to the horizon. Because the pilot, you didn't know. Because the pilot, you didn't look. Because the pilot, you thought everything was okay. No wonder pride cometh before a fall. And in this case, a plane crash. Specifically during those times of difficult weather, and even during just a regular check of the instruments, Air Force pilots are taught a very simple formula that has saved the lives of countless pilots. It's called Recognize, Confirm, Recover, or just RCR. My brother is a lieutenant colonel and wing commander at Scott Air Force Base. He's the one who told me about this formula years back. Mike, RCR is so important, he would tell me, especially in a storm. 
As pilots, we chart our course, we check the weather, we do all that we can to plan a smooth flight. <laughs> that sounds like life, doesn't it? He went on, but once we're up there, anything can happen. He went on, but once we're up there, we have to know what we're doing. It's not like we plan to fly a $100 million jet into a storm intentionally. But when we do, we need to recognize our situation and then our instruments because it's possible the storm has altered our heading or maybe our turn coordination is off or our attitude is off or maybe everything is off. And this is when we confirm that we're doing okay or that something might be wrong, which is when we recover. My friends, this really fits the Christian walk. I want to use the attitude indicator for a moment to remind you once again that you're not weird. All right? Because you can do everything you can to keep your attitude in line with the horizon. You can keep staring at it. You can check it every 10 seconds. But when a storm comes, adjustments always need to be made. There are no exceptions. The only time you're just weird, though, is when you do nothing. If you choose to ignore your spiritual attitude indicator, which is God's word, and by the way, it is a choice, things will only get worse. You may face an occasional up and your heart will, will with all of its deceit, say something like, there now. See? Things will get better and you didn't even attend church. You didn't even attend church once this week. You haven't read your Bible. You haven't prayed. And look at you. You can do these things without God. That's what your heart will tell you. You say, that sounds like the devil, Pastor Mike. No, no, no. It's the heart. Because the heart is deceitful above all things. All means all and that's all all means, right? And so therefore the heart is more deceitful, I would say, than even the devil. Don't give him so much credit. But with each downward turn to follow, you'll be asking yourself why things are so bad. All the while ignoring God's word, avoiding God's people, and attending church as if it's some sort of a penance. And that God will be proud of you for doing so and will most assuredly bless you for enduring church. <laughs> if a pilot comes to his commanding general with an attitude of, hey, I, uh, Check my instruments when I took off. Are you proud of me? The commanding general might ask, well, what did you do the rest of the time? <laughs> you see, folks, I'm not saying that you need to be in church to make you bitter, but to make you better, uh, to keep you from crashing, to teach you how necessary it is to place your faith in the instrument of God's word and to get the training necessary to place your faith in the instrument of God's word. 1 Timothy 1.19 says, Holding faith in a good conscience, which some, now listen to what I say, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Or to complement the parallel in this, our study, plane crash. Turn back to Ephesians 5.15, okay? This is, an, this is another great verse describing the need to stay closely familiar with the instruments of our spiritual plane. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. If you're in the habit of marking in your Bibles, underline circumspectly. You might also want to write out in the margin, balanced attitude. Walking circumspectly is the same as walking with proper balance. Sounds like the indica uh, attitude indicator to me. What do you think? The days are evil means that there are many temptations along the way, and these temptations vary. And it's best not to focus on the sins you're probably to, uh, you, you're, you're able to name right off the top of your head, okay? Clearly, the ones you're prominently aware of are not the ones that you need to keep in check. The temptation to murder? Steal? Commit adultery? I have never woken up and prayed, Lord, keep me from killing somebody today. <laughs> Lord, help me not to steal anything today. And I realize that there, there are some kleptomaniacs who need to pray this way. Last Friday evening, 
uh, we heard principle number one preached on. If God is against it, so am I. And I love the way Steve Curranton explained that in his everyday walk, every time something happened with each periodic moment of his life, he became determined to ask himself, is God against this decision that I'm making or is he for it? And as he determined this with every little decision, it brought him further and further away from the border of doing drugs. And if you're listening, it may be that deciding whether or not to do drugs or to steal or to gamble or to drink is something that you need to pay more attention to. But if it is, if this is the case, you need to raise your altitude. Get off the ground a little bit and go up to higher planes. I'm, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Now that's a completely different message for a completely different day, okay? Uh, but as a, as a general rule, don't let these big obvious sins distract you from the ones not so apparent. And I didn't say smaller or less evil. But the ones not as obvious, those are the ones that lead to the big ones. How many of you remember during the start of the war on terror, the anthrax scare? Hmm? If you walked outside and your car was filled with that white powder that everybody was afraid of, all right, and in the dirt in front of the car it said, this is anthrax, just like that terror letter that you saw just now, you'd keep your distance, right? Now, suppose I took a teeny tiny pinch of that stuff. I just took a little pinch with tweezers and I asked you to hold out your hand, what would you do? You'd run the other way, wouldn't you? Because no matter how large and obvious or how small, it's a fast-acting bacteria that will make you sick and then kill you. James 1, 14 to 15 says that every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Wherefore is by one man, Romans 5, 12, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. It did not name the quantity, the type, how obvious or how concealed. Sin is sin. And we see clearly in God's word that sin brings forth death. It could be pride. It could be murder. It could be lust. It could be lying. It could be envy. Slander, hatred, adultery, disobedience to parents, drugs, self-praise or evil thoughts, drunkenness or stealing. Sin is sin is sin is sin and sin will kill. However white, however black, you can add an adjective to describe the sin if you want to, but in God's economy, the cost is the same across the board. Every, it's like the Dollar Tree. Everything costs a dollar. All right. Only in this particular case, be it the white lie aisle, the drug aisle, the porn aisle, or the envy aisle, everything costs your life. So what I'm saying is looking for the black nimbus with visible electric volts going through it can be a distraction from the smaller storms you might think that you can manage. When in fact the hidden ones are the ones you should worry about the most. The little silent killers. I'm talking about the temptation to worry, to hold a grudge, to complain, to envy. This is what it means when it says redeeming the time because the days are evil. This means that we need to get a grip on our will and get it in line with the instruments. I love the words to this song about the Bible. Now its critics are many and believers are few, but one thing that I found to be true if you find when you read it that there's something wrong, then there's something wrong with you. Oh yes, the instruments are what, are what we are to trust, not how we feel. David, speaking of God's precepts, says in Psalm, 119, or Psalm, Psalm 19 and verse 11, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Pilate paraphrase version, if you trust the instruments and make the necessary adjustments to stay in line with them, you're pretty smart. <laughs> now, flying a plane is something learned over time. 
You can't just sit under a flight instructor for one hour and expect to be an expert pilot. It's the same with our Christian walk. As foolish as it is to never check the instruments in flight, it is equally as foolish to think that a little bit of time with God will make you an expert Christian. The only expert Christians that I've ever met is the one who can't live without him and can't get enough of him. Yeah, I'll let you know when I need you, Pastor. I'm good. Thanks. Appreciate you calling. <laughs> that kind of a thing. Understand, friend, anyone, anyone can take the controls in their hand and steer a plane. I remember as a child, my grandpa used to let me take hold of the controls as a four-year-old. <laughs> But he wasn't about to let me do that for long. Otherwise, I'd have taken us off course because I didn't know how to read the heading indicator. I still don't know how to read a heading indicator. And then time would be wasted, hence redeeming the time, recovering time lost. But a, a good pilot will take the controls in his hands and adjust them accordingly based on the plane's instrument readings. A fool takes uh, the controls of his life and steers his plane in whatever direction he chooses, disregarding the indicators in the plane. Returning to the introductory story, imagine if John Hiltabeitel had chosen to ignore his instruments the way so many Christians ignore the need to study their Bibles. It would have been a catastrophic situation. But how many Christians fly blindly every day without regarding the Word of God concerning mental health except on Sundays? Boy, Pastor, you better have a good sermon for me because I am in real need of it. And yet you haven't done any reading in your Bible. You haven't done any praying. And it's almost like you expect my sermon to somehow be some kind of a pick-me-up for you. Can I just say good days, for our, our, good days are the worst things that can happen to people like that because those kinds of days only embolden them to continue drifting off course. They come out, they come to me in tears, confused about why they can't seem to overcome their anxiety, almost expecting me to produce some kind of an easy button. It doesn't work that way. I'm not a miracle worker. I'm just the flight instructor. Get it? All right? You're the, you're the one that's got to man your own aircraft. People tend to forget that the pastor has his own aircraft to control, uh, to fly. And as I've already said, Depression, anxiety, stress, fear, and even anger are indicators that sin is what is affecting our peace. I want us to consider Colossians 3.15. All right, if you turn there, will you turn there with me as we approach the runway and land the plane for today? This verse will help us to tie today's message in with the final message in our series. Wow, number eight is next week. Hopefully the uh, internet won't crash this time. <laughs> Colossians 3.15 says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, uh, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. This is probably one of my most favorite verses next to my life verse. I realize that all the Bible verses are, are, are great. I realize that. I, I, I realize that, uh, that, that, that they're dependable, but... This verse in particular has aided me with decisions, avoiding depression, resisting temptation, and obeying the will of God for a large portion of my life. I'm a visual person, so if you try to describe something to me, you'd better add some color to your words, all right? When it comes to having faith, because of this, I struggle. But this verse has helped me have assurance in those areas that I was unsure. I specifically want you to notice that peace is also an indicator light on your spiritual aircraft. If you've ever driven a U-Haul, and I've driven way too many of those, all right, there's a gauge on the dashboard called the fuel economy gauge. It looks, uh, let me pull that up here. Oh, bother. And I can't seem to pull it up here. Let me see if I can... The fuel, oh, there it is. Okay, the fuel economy gauge. Let me pull that up for you. There we, there we go. Okay, the fuel economy gauge. The sticker to the right of it says, keep it in the green. Has anybody seen one of those? <laughs> While driving, I had, to, uh, I had to be conscious 
of how much gas I was giving the engine. Uh, I honestly didn't enjoy it because I enjoy using the cruise control. But honestly, there are times where I wish there was a cruise control for our life. Can I get an amen there? <laughs> if the needle passed over the green and into the red, I'd end up burning more gas than was necessary. And this is what RCR is all about. It's something that we need to keep in constant check and practice it on a daily basis, moment by moment, step by step. Our spiritual condition is what will affect us emotionally. Here are some of the red lights with just a two-word description, okay? I'm going to share this with you, okay? First of all, anger. Anger is a blocked goal. Anxiety, all right? Anxiety is an uncertain goal. Then, uh, stress is an exhausting goal. Depression, another red light, is an impossible goal. That's really, really sad, isn't it? All right, now, get this one. Peace is a trustworthy goal. You've got four red light indicators and one green light indicator. Always make sure the green light stays on. Is the red light of anger on? Recognize that it's on. I'm angry, but why? Hmm. Confirm it by finding out. Do you have scriptural justification to be angry? Can I just tell you frankly before you give an answer? Probably not. <laughs> rarely, and I mean rarely, has there ever been a time when I've been angry that I had, to, had a justifiable reason? You might think you do. You might feel like you do. But the chances that your attitude is correct is, uh, it's unlikely. So check the instrument. Then recover the peace that rules. Place whatever is making you angry into the hands of the God who is in control of all things. Let him turn that object of stumbling into an object of security. Accept that this thing hindering your plans might just be what God is using to bring his plans to pass. My wife tells me this kind of stuff all the time, and I'm like, oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> How about the red light of anxiety? Recognize it. Okay, I'm really freaking out now. <laughs> Confirm what's making you anxious. What is it that you're worried about? As we pull up to the boarding deck, I want us to turn to Philippians 4.6. All right? Philippians 4.6. It says this. All right? If you got your Bibles, all right? I'm going I'm to let you give you a chance to turn there. Okay? Philippians 4.6. Be careful. That's be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God. There's your green light. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. As soon as you, as soon as you uh, uh, fix the controls and everything's even on the horizon, your attitude's right in line with the horizon, all of a sudden all the red lights turn to the one green one. That means everything's good. I always enjoy that when I'm driving down the road and I see that. So that peace will give you assurance that you're doing good, that you're doing great. Remember, your heart is deceitful above all things. Recognize each red light. Confirm why it's on. Recover the green light. Thanks for flying new grace air. Lord, I do pray that you would just help us, Lord, as we go through life, each of us, those that are watching. I pray that you would help each of us to trust in you, to trust in the instruments that you've given to us. Thank you so much for your love to us. In Christ's name, amen. The last message is going to be called Christ's Attitude in the Storm. Hope to see you then.